morning. Bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for the honor of being in your house today. We thank you for this beautiful morning. We ask your blessings upon us that are here and the blessings upon our friends and loved ones who could not be here today. And we ask that you open our minds and our hearts to take in whatever message you would have us to listen to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're so glad you're here today. Let's open with our hymn of praise, 473, Cleanse Me. Let's stand. Sorry, what is it? Oh, <laughs> well, that won't work, will it? <laughs> yeah, we could just use our hymn books. 473. Search me, oh God. Take this time to greet each other.
you'd like to take your bulletin, we have some announcements this morning. For the calendar of events, our Tuesday Bible study at 11 a.m. here. And choir practice is on hold until September. If anyone wants to sing or do anything special, we do have one opening date the first Sunday in September. I don't think the choir will be quite ready then because we haven't practiced yet. <laughs> so if you'd like to do something, that would be great. Um, Sunday school every Sunday. We have a board meeting on September 6th at 6 p.m. Our homecoming will be September 18th. We'll have a special music group that day and a, a dinner. So you'll hear more about that later. And August birthdays. Let's see. Not sure we've sung a happy birthday in August yet. So we have Jack McFarlane. Where'd he go? There he is. You're not sitting in your normal seat. <laughs> Debbie Chenoweth, right here. Uh, Luke Sweet's not here, but then let's see. Diane's here. And Gladys Wright is watching us on the internet. So we do have a birthday card to sign for her today, too. Brenda Rash and Chip Sweet. So this is the birthday card for Gladys Wright. She was a member here many years ago, and, and I believe still is, but she came to our rummage sale a couple weeks ago. She's, 100 and, she's turning 103. 104. 104. Oh, sorry. So here's the card, and Ron's going to bring it down for you. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Does anyone else have a birthday this month? I'm glad I didn't. Glad I didn't miss anybody. <clears throat> okay. This time we will have our. Um, scripture reading. The scripture today I'm going to be reading from uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 12. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, an evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. For you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace the mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. We have one more announcement. You probably noticed in your bulletin you have a flyer that next week is Brig of Friends Sunday. So please invite someone, and there are ideas of how to figure out who to invite on the back. This is our communion song, 476, Whiter Than Snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to
week uh, I was looking through the TV for something to watch and uh, happened across the History Channel, it's Ancient Aliens. I don't usually watch that show, but they happen to be talking about uh, Albert Einstein's brain. And yes, when he died, they did preserve his brain and still in storage, I guess, so people can study it. But uh, they were talking about what makes a genius. And uh, one of the possibilities was the difference in brain and brain sizes, or a different part of the brain is bigger, and there's no real definite answer, but that was only one possibility that, that makes you a genius. Another one was that uh, there's all this technical information, advanced information is just out there floating in the air. And uh, all you have to do is just be able to tune into that in some way, in some form, either by meditation or through dreams or whatever. And one example was a man in India who had no formal education, yet he was able to come up with some of these complex math equations and stuff. So, it just, you know, somehow he tapped into that information. The third one was uh, information can be supplied by a god, a muse, or a spirit. Of course, I didn't know for, what a muse was for sure, so I looked that up. As a verb, it is the creative spirit of an individual or a state of deep thought. But as a noun, According to dictionary, is any of nine sister goddesses associated with graces in Greek mythology and regarded as presiding over learning and the creative arts or be the personification of a guiding genius or principal source of inspiration. So that word inspiration, on the show one of these professors said, inspiration means to be in spirit. So I got to look, well, what does the dictionary say about inspiration, the meaning of it? So according to, to the dictionary, it says inspiration is a divine in influence or action upon the lives of certain persons that are believed to qualify them to receive and communicate sacred revelation as interpreted within Christianity as a direct action of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that kind of amazed me that that was what their description was in the dictionary. You might think, well, what does all this have to do with communion? But during the Last Supper, we know that Christ set up uh, what we know as communion, the Last Supper, that uh, his blood, and shed blood, and broken body uh, was the sacrifice for our sins. But also at that same supper, he promised the disciples and ourselves that he would not leave us orphans. And in John 14 and verses 16 and 17, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And of course, what does the Holy Spirit does? He does many things. He comforts, teaches, gives wisdom and knowledge, testifies about Jesus and God, convicts of sin, prays on our behalf, and equips us for ministry. So, you know, we may not be all be geniuses, but we do have a correct connection with the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is, is make that connection with him. So. In a sense, I guess we can all claim to be genius, geniuses, but today as we go to communion, just let us remember that we are blessed to be inspired or be in spirit with the Holy Ghost. So let us pray. Our Father, again, we just thank you for what you did. You were willing to go to the cross and suffer and die for the forgiveness of our sin. But you also sent us the Holy Ghost that we could constantly be in communication with him. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Shall we pray? Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to be here today. We're thankful, Father, for each one who's here. We're thankful, Father, that when we know Jesus is Lord and Savior, that there is a spark of the divine in each of us. And so today, Father, we give thanks for not only being here, but for those around us. And we pray, Father, you might give us a sense of joy that comes from being with one another and with you. Now, Father, part of our joy is to recognize all that you have given us. And now we pray, Father, that we might give something back to you. We pray, Father, that you would bless the gift and the giver and those who cannot give. We pray, Father, that what is used might be used in your name to further your work here and there and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In a moment, Valerie is going to come with our special music. We'll have our scripture reading. Please turn to Matthew. We'll be looking at Matthew 26. Today we finish up our series on uh, the apostles. How many of you have uh, stories about school on your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren from last week? Okay, well, we have a, a six-year-old who went to kindergarten, and uh, there was some concern about him being there, so the teacher and his mother communicated by email back and forth throughout the day, and mother was just overjoyed. He was just doing great. He was happy to be there. He participated in everything, and then when the Day was over and he went out of his room. He smiled at the teacher and then he looked back and he said, when do I get out of here anyway? 179 more days and he'll be out. Well, we look at uh, Judas. We have to have a little humor ahead of time because he's a hard one to study. Look at Matthew 26 and we'll be looking at verses 14 and 15 and 16. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and he asked, 
What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And by the way, if you read the Old Testament carefully, if you owned a beast of burden and somebody killed your beast of burden, or if you owned a slave and somebody eliminated your slave, somebody had to pay 30 pieces of silver to replace the beast or to replace the slave. And then 16, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
shall we pray. Our Father, we're thankful that it is time. Thankful, Father, for Valerie and her gifts and the way that she blesses us and challenges us. Pray, Father, that you'll teach us through the life of Judas Iscariot, such a negative person. But we pray, Father, you'll help us to see there's another side of that. And we pray, Father, for those who are here in need of joy, we pray that they will find that in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The devotional reads, Philip Nolan was the subject of a fictitious book by Edward Everett Hale. It was called The Man Without a Country. It was a novel loosely based on the life of Aaron Burr and his 1807 trial against the government. At the trial, no one said, I wish I would never hear the name of the United States again. As a result of that request, the judge exiled Nolan to a ship, a floating jail, for the next 50 years. The book records that on his deathbed, Nolan recanted and had a change of heart. Like the fictitious Nolan, Judas Iscariot was a real man without a country. And today, when you think of his name, it's a name that means treachery and it means betrayal. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at chapter 13, and we begin talking about Judas as a betrayer. John 13. Look at verse 25. Peter asked Jesus, who is going to betray you? In 26, Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread after I dip it into the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And then in 27, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus told him, what you're going to do, do it quickly. <coughs> William Barclay struggles over a number of pages trying to figure out why Judas did what he did. There are those who think he was just greedy and he was after avarice or after what he could get. And we're going to see a little bit later on. He did keep the money. He was a treasurer. And so that might have been part of it. But he was also disillusioned. We know that Judas Iscariot was a revolutionary, part of the dagger party, that wanted Jesus to come along and overthrow the Roman government. And they tend to be violent. And by this time he knows, well, Jesus is not going to be that kind of a figure. And then some people think he was just jealous. And as we read about him, we think he tended to be a jealous person. And he was also the odd man out. He was the only one who was not from Galilee. But the last answer is the one that I believe. He simply, he simply was taken over by the devil. And we're going to see that over and over here. Secondly, he was not only a betrayer, he was an apostle. If we read Matthew 10, 4, he's listed with the other 11. If we meet Mark 3, 19, he's listed along with the others. If we read Luke 6 and verse 16, he's listed with the other 11. We know he was an apostle. A friend of mine went to the Hanson Place Central Methodist Church in Brooklyn, New York. And there at the Hanson Place Church, at the very front, they have a long communion rail and it has 12 different notches in the rail. 11 of those notches have statuettes of the 11 apostles. It has their name and their symbol above each figure in the notch. But when you come to number 12, it simply says Judas. There is no notch, there is no symbol. 
There are no statuette. Thirdly, turn with me to Luke. This time we're in chapter 22. We go from the apostle and the betrayer to the devil himself. In John 6, the writer there calls him the devil. Look at Luke 22 and verse 3. It says, Satan entered Judas called Iscariot. In response, the chief priests and the teachers of the law began looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. This is the one that I think really encapsulates his life. He was the devil. Remember Flip Wilson? We're dating ourselves, aren't we? And every time something happened to Geraldine, what did she say? The devil made me do it. Well, that's kind of what's operational in the life of Judas here. In verse 25, it says, or 24, he went to the chief priests and the other officers of the temple guard, and he discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. Notice it's intentional here. He knows what he's doing. He goes to them, and he discusses with them. And then it says in verse 5, they were delighted, and they agreed to give him money. Herbert Lockyer would write about Judas Iscariot when he was 100. He lived to be, like Gladys, over 100. But when he was 100, he wrote this about Judas Iscariot. In the life of Judas, we see a process. We see a thought that became an act. We see an act that became a habit. We see a habit that became a character. And we see a character that shaped one's life into eternity. It begins with a thought, then an act, then a habit, and then the character that makes a difference in all of eternity. Well, that was Judas Iscariot. In verse 6, he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when there was no crowd around. We sang earlier this morning a hymn. In the book here, it's called Cleanse Me. In a lot of other books, it's called Search Me, O God. And it's written by J. Edwin Orr. J. Edwin Orr would write all kinds of hymns, but he was also a minister, and he did revivals. And he was doing one revival in New Zealand, of all places. And the night before the revival, all kinds of people had come forward. And uh, he still had that on his mind. And he was going to the post office, and as he stood in line, he was going to mail something, but it kept remarking to him what had happened the night before. And so he took out an envelope that he was not using, and he wrote the words to this verse of, Search me, O God. Judas needed that in this moment. There's literally nothing that is breaking what he's doing. He had an idea, he had a thought, it became an action and then a habit and then part of his character. He found himself going to talk to people who could make it happen and then even strategizing and then getting his cut of all of that. He's literally filled with the devil. Then turn with me to John 12. Here we see him, as we referred to before, as a treasurer. Look at John 12 and verse 3. Mary took her pine of pure nard and poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, and she wiped it all with her hair. Verse 4. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray Jesus, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And then in verse 6, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, 
he used to help himself to what was put into it. There is a lesson here about Judas. It's interesting to me, first of all, that Jesus chose him. And then of all people, he put him in charge of the money. I don't believe that's a mistake. I believe that Jesus knew what he was doing. And he knew that in the life of Judas was a devilish personality. And yet, from what we know and what Jesus said and what would happen to him and what we read in God's word and what Paul and Peter and others tell us, we know that that's the devil we face every single day. Every single day we face a, a Judas in our own life in some way or another. A lady by the name of Rebecca Weston has a book entitled The Meaning of Reason. And in discussing the life of Judas, she says, his life is treachery. And treachery is betrayal. It's a betrayal of the familiar to the stranger, of those who are near to those who are far away, to those whom one is bound by real interest, to one who will treat you like a foreigner. That was Judas. Judas and the other disciples treated him as family. And he goes to these foreigners and they give him money to eliminate his Lord. Turn back with me to the passage we read in Matthew 26. Here we see the bargainer. And this, to me, is uh, maybe the worst part of it. Look at Matthew 26 and verse 14 and 15 and 16. Judas went to the chief priest and he asked him, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? What's in it for me? He had been with Jesus for three years. He had watched Jesus heal people. He had heard the parables and the stories, and he had even been a part of some of the healing himself. And now he says, what are you willing to give him if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. From then on. A number of things could have intersected here. He could have come to himself. God could have struck him blind. God could have killed him with a lightning. Remember that lightning strike we had earlier? But none of that happened. And so he let all of this sour and he let it fester. And he looked what? For an opportunity to hand him over. And the deal is made about a kiss. Now, a kiss is a very customary thing in that part of the world. If you go there today, uh, even men today still kiss one another. But it was especially reserved for the rabbi, for the great teacher. And it would be a commonplace thing for you to do. And so what does he do? He makes the deal here. And whoever I kiss, that's going to be the Jesus. We want to make sure in the darkness of the night, in the midst of all that is there and all the people, we want to get the right one. And Barclay says, it's the most terrible kiss in all of history. It's an act of hypocrisy and an act of treachery. In the paper not long ago, there was an illustration about a robber in Cleveland. He was a young man. He broke into a house and his intent was to steal whatever was there. When he breaks in, he sees an older lady in a chair and he realizes, that's my Sunday school teacher from years ago. And he goes up and he begins to talk to her. And at one point, he kisses her on the cheek. And at another point, he said, you were always wonderful to me. And then after the kiss and after 
all the discussion, he grabbed her pocketbook and stole $210 from her. He had all these opportunities to say no. That's Judas here. And so the worst thing here is the kiss. It's hypocrisy, it's treachery. We sang earlier that hymn, Whiter Than Snow by James Nicholson, and that chorus, Whiter than snow, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That still could have happened to him. It happened to a David. Think of what David did. David had sexual relations with a woman who was not his wife. David arranged all of that. He could have had all of these things that interfere. And then in the process, they conceive a child together. And then he worries that somehow he's going to be found out. And so he brings her husband home from the army and he tries to work it out so they're together. So the man thinks, Uriah thinks, it's his child. But Urias did not feel right about being away from his fellow soldiers and he stayed by himself. And so what does David do? He has him killed, putting him in the front of all the battle. And yet, after all of that, he was a man after God's own heart. Read and reread Psalm 51 this week, where David pleads with God, and God basically forgives him. God says, you gotta live with the consequences. You gotta reap what you've sown, but you are forgiven. Judas could have had all of that. He could have been washed whiter than snow, and yet he continued. Look at the last thing. We see the killer here. In chapter 27 of Matthew, look at verses 3, 4, and 5. Judas was seized with remorse. He returned the silver coins to the chief priests and the elders but he sees with remorse afterwards and is eating him alive. Then I look at his acknowledgement in verse four. I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood. You've seen his Lord go to the cross and die there. I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood. So then look at five. He threw the money into the temple. We don't know how long, but he had worked out an agreement. They'd gone back and forth, how much they were going to pay him. And they'd agreed on that amount. And here he throws the money, of all places, into the temple. And then he went away, and he hanged himself. He had a tortured conscience. He had a tarnished name. He had a tragic end and a terrible eternity. If you ever read Dante's Inferno, there's a passage in it when you go through hell. And within hell, there are different circles and the very lowest circle of hell is Lucifer and Judas Iscariot, the worst punishment in hell. In the book of Acts, we're told the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and then he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. And it was called the field of blood. At this point, we always have a confusion here. Did he fall or was he hanged? And what we believe now, he was hung in the valley of Hinnom, and there was a, a precipice where he hanged himself, but it was overlooking the valley. And we believe that in the process of hanging himself, then he fell to the ground, and when he did so, his insides literally burst out. A horrible end for a killer. A theologian in our time was asked, why in the world did Jesus choose Judas Iscariot in the very first place? 
the theologian thought a long time, and then he said, I don't really know, but a harder question for me is this, why in the world did Jesus choose me? Knowing what he knew about me, why did he choose me? Probably the greatest painting Da Vinci did was The Last Supper. And when he began work on The Last Supper, he decided he would choose the Christ figure first. And he went all around Rome looking for a person who was uh, handsome, a person who was well regarded in the community. And he found such a young man, a handsome young man, who happened to be the chorister in his congregation. And he came and readily he did all of the work on the Jesus figure in the Last Supper. Over the next several months and even a few years, he began to do other disciples, the other apostles. One by one, he did them. He had trouble with the idea of Judas and what Judas would look like. So he decided he would wait and do Judas the very last. And finally the time came, everything was done and after several years he was just waiting to paint the Judas figure. And so he found himself roaming around the city and not long into his journey he found a fellow who was a panhandler and a fellow who was covered with boils and a very ugly looking man, had a darkness about him. And uh, he asked him to come and the man asked, will you pay me? And he said, I will. And so he painted him in the Judas figure that we have today in the Last Supper. When he was finished, Carlo Bontadrelli got up from the table and he said, uh, you don't remember me, do you, Leonardo? And Da Vinci said, no, have we met before? And Bondanelli said, yes, a few years ago you painted me as a Christ figure. And in this short period of time, I have fallen. We're going to sing the hymn, I Must Tell Jesus. I love that hymn. It's written by Elisha Hoffman. Hoffman had a lot of tragedy in his life. He hadn't been married very long. He worked in a publishing house, and uh, his wife died. He'd been there 11 years. And so he went back to seminary and decided he would begin a new life. And he took a church in Philadelphia and he would be in that church for 33 years. In the middle of his ministry there, he had quite a counseling ministry. And a lady came to him and she had all kinds of problems. She had health issues, she had family issues, she had financial issues. And he said, the more that I listened, the more overwhelmed and burdened I was. And finally he said, it must have been a God thing. I found myself saying to her, you must tell Jesus. You must go to him. You must tell Jesus. And he said that night he remembered what he had said. And he sat down and he began to pour out what he felt about that lady and how she needed Christ and how no counseling on earth would meet her need but his. And with that, he would give us this hymn, I Must Tell Jesus. Sometimes I think there is a small difference between an Apostle Paul and a Saul. There is a small difference between a Peter in the garden, a Peter in the courtyard, and a Peter who would found the early church. Sometimes I think there is a small margin between a Judas and someone like John or Andrew or one of the other apostles. The apostles learned that they needed to tell Jesus and they went to him over and over and over again. There are things today that I need to go to Jesus about. 
And there are things today that you need to go to Jesus about. I must tell Jesus. I must tell him. Shall we pray? Father, there may be someone here who doesn't know you. I pray, Father, if that is the case, they might come accepting Jesus and the whiteness that comes from your forgiveness, whiter than snow. Some of us may have come here today, Father, burdened. There seems to be a burden on the faces and the countenance of some. I pray, Father, that in this moment of burden that you might open the way for them to come to you and in the pouring out of their heart and their soul and their being they could find what they need in this hour maybe they need forgiveness maybe they need direction maybe they need your joy but we know father whenever we tell you we always find what we need in that moment for the day ahead I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Number 471 is our hymn, I Must Tell Jesus. And we're only going to do the first two verses. They're the personal verses in this hymn. Will you stand and sing, I must tell Jesus. And if God is leading you, you come today. be seated. If you'll look at your bulletin on the back and on the screen, we have a list of prayer concerns, um, all the things around the world that are going on and around our country, and then the prayer concerns for those who are ill. Um, one that was mentioned this morning is Rod Collison is going to have surgery tomorrow. Rod has been visiting a few times lately. And um, he is the uh, nephew of Tom Collis. Um, our, our grandson, Titus Geisel, is going to be in the hospital on Friday just for routine tests about his seizures and to check how his, um, check how his um, seizures are doing with his medicine. Are there other prayer requests this morning? Yes. My brother called me yesterday afternoon and he's on the way to uh, a heart uh, specialty hospital with his wife, Brenda. Uh, they're there this morning. I don't have any problems with the rest. So I want to get in their blood pressure is out of this world, but it's 250 over 90. So they were working to try to get that under control. He's had previous heart issues. 
Okay, that is um, Brenda Fleming. It's having heart issues. Anyone else? Yes, Jay. At work this week, we had an 80 year old man come into our building. He mistakenly went down the wrong hallway and fell down 17 stairs. Oh. He fell to the basement, went down all the way, hit his head on the concrete floor of the basement. His name is Rich Curdle. Um, last time I heard, he was actually doing better. They had the lifeline in. Rich Pertle from Solvin, who has been injured and is in the hospital. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray. Please stand if you're able. Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to be here. We're thankful, Father, for Valerie and others who had prayers or devotions or music, or took up our offering, or gave us a, a handshake at the beginning. Thankful, Father, that all of that led to our worship of you. Now, Father, as we take our leave, we remember all of these who have been mentioned. We remember the uh, sister-in-law of Jim and Carol. Pray, Father, for your healing touch. Remember the uh, man that uh, Jay spoke about, Father. We remember uh, Rod and his surgery tomorrow in Indianapolis. We know it's a very involved surgery, Father. We pray that you'll go ahead of them to work with the surgeons, to give them the skill and the wisdom that they need. Pray, Father, for Lisa as she uh, tries to remain with him or go back and forth, that you'll bless her as well. Continue to remember Dorothy, Father, know that she's in the nursing home. We remember Rhea Anthony, Father, in uh, more treatment. Pray for her in Florida. Remember Carol, Father, with her boot. Pray that that might improve. Thankful, Father, for school being back in session. Pray, Father, for all of those who teach our kids and the kids themselves, that you might watch and care for them. Remember uh, Deb Chenoweth, Father, and her family, and all that is going on there. We're grateful, Father, that wherever we go, and whatever the human condition, you're there beside us. We're thankful, Father, for these various apostles we've looked at the past three months. We're thankful, Father, for each one, because uh, even with a Judas, we can learn from them. And we pray, Father, that as we learn, it will send us directly to you, that we'll come to you, Father, and pour out our heart and our head knowledge and our soul. And we pray, Father, it will drive us to your word. It will open up avenues of prayer, and we'll begin to sense your presence in our lives. Go with us, Father, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Let's close with our chorus. Thank you.